Hey folks, Ray from DCBamerica.com here. After almost five years since the last major Polar Multisport GPS device release, they are out now with the new Vantage series. Uh, now it's actually two watches. It's the Polar Vantage V and the Vantage M. Uh, essentially at two different price points, but very, very, very similar features. Uh, the Vantage V is at $499, the Vantage M is at $270, 279 something like that. Um, and they have almost the exact same Multisport features, but there are some differentiators when it comes to things like training load and recovery, uh, as well as running power, which is one of the big new features on the Vantage. I'm gonna talk about the features and then I'm gonna show you what it looks like on the user interface itself of the watch. I've got some data from a run, we'll look through, uh, and we'll kind of wrap things up. Now, one of the most obvious changes to the watch itself is the fact that it's round now. Uh, unlike the past, the VA-100 and a lot of other Polar's mid-range watches, they've been kind of rectangular. Um, with that, you've had also a drop in the weight. So the V, that's the black one here, uh, though it comes in both colors, it's just the colors I happen to have. The Vantage V goes from 79 grams down to 66 grams, uh, whereas the Vantage M here is down at 45 grams. Uh, so nice and light. You also notice from a size standpoint, they're about the same as like a Garmin 400-935, so in that same kind of class in terms of the thickness and the, the shape and size of the, the bezel itself, so not too bad. The next biggest thing you're going to notice is the optical sensor on the back. Um, now, of course, Polar's doing been doing optical sensors now for a couple years, uh, not like as long as some of the other competitors, but they've been in the market there. Uh, and they've always kind of upped the game when it comes to the number of uh, LEDs in the optical sensor. And there's LEDs and basically the part of the sensor that goes ahead and reads what the LED transmits into your skin. And I think the way the conversation went at Polar was bigger is better. They went with an astounding nine LEDs in the back of this thing, which is like three times more than anyone else out there. Uh, it's it's pretty impressive. You know, I'd say from like an accuracy standpoint, I think that's actually paying off. Uh, I'm seeing really good results from accuracy on this beta unit, uh, but that's kind of cool. Also, in fact, there's actually an additional um, yellow and orange LED that they have not turned on there. Uh, and the reason is they haven't really seen a lot of benefits doing that, and there is a power hit to that. Uh, so essentially, different color LEDs will go into different uh, depths in your skin. Uh, so the red goes one depth down in your skin, and the green goes another depth. Uh, and the orange yellow one was sort of in between those, and in their kind of testing so far, it's been like, meh, hasn't really done anything for it compared to the battery hit that they take. Finally, with that, you'll also notice on the back there is these little like uh, four dots there. Um, those four dots are both charging contacts for putting on the charger and charging your watch um, and transferring data if you have a computer, uh, but also it's a skin contact sensor. So it'll detect whether or not it's on contact with your skin. That doesn't seem to have any like practical applications beyond that in terms of, for example, skin temperature or anything like that. It's purely contact. The idea though there is they can go ahead and use that skin sensor to turn off the LEDs uh, when it's not being used, like sitting on a desk or something like that. Next on the list is the GPS sensor. They've changed up the GPS sensor. Polar's used a variety of GPS sensors in the past, uh, different GPS chipsets. Uh, they've gone from Surf being the one they've had in the past a long while ago, to MediaTek, uh, and here they've gone to Sony, which is the exact same move that Suunto made with the Suunto 9 this earlier this summer. Um, and that's been a little bit of a mixed thing for Suunto, and I think that's gonna be the case for Polar as well. In my discussions with them about this before I started testing the watch, they were pretty confident they weren't gonna have the same issues that Suunto had, but in my testing since that meeting, I'd actually say it's worse. Uh, so I think that road is a little ways to go still. Um, we'll have to see how it works. Again, this is beta. That's something important to mention uh, once again is that this watch will not start shipping until the end of October likely. Uh, so between now and then, this isn't like a full review. It's just simply an early look at things. If you see people that are posting full reviews on this watch, just close the tab because this watch is nowhere near complete. There's tons of beta features, tons of things that simply aren't even in the watch yet, as we'll talk about in just a second. Next, you have the new color screens. Now on the Vantage V, the more expensive one, it's a touchscreen, or as a Vantage M, it's not a touchscreen. Um, both of them have plenty of buttons though. Uh, and in fact, Polar is so button focused, and I think actually in a good way when you're talking athletic devices, that once you're in sport modes, it's buttons only on the Vantage V. They disable the touchscreen, just purely buttons. Uh, and of course with the M, there's no touchscreen at all. Um, with all that, you may be wondering what the battery life happens or what happens to the battery life. Uh, in the case of the Vantage V, uh, it is a 40 hours straight up, like one mode, one second recording, optical heart rate sensor enabled, 40 hours of battery life, which is pretty flipping good, by the way. Uh, and the Vantage M is 30 hours, uh, optical sensor enabled, one second recording. Also pretty flipping good. Keep in mind, that eclipses uh, basically Suunto and Garmin, like all their competitors in this size of watch, or even not this size of watch, uh, for one second recording. Now, when it comes to new features, 
there's kind of only three, in fact. Uh, number one is running power on the Vantage V series. Uh, now, in the past, Polar has supported running power with third party sensors like Stride and even RunScribe, I think, is supposed to work as well. Uh, but now they're doing their own thing. So, with the Vantage V, it's going to use the accelerometer as well as the barometric altimeter to give running power numbers while you're out running. Uh, and so, that's a pretty big leap. You'll know Garmin has the same thing, but you have to use one of their sensors. You have to use either it's called the RD pod, this little potty clip on the back of your running shorts, or you have to use your heart rate strap, uh, but it, it's not something that's just in the wrist itself with just the watch. Polar, just the watch. Now the Vantage M does not have that built in because it does not have a barometric altimeter, which is super, super important uh, to measure essentially grade and determine running power. How well does it work? Well, that's a bit iffy. Uh, in my testing so far, it's more than Stride, and it's less than Garmin in terms of, like your wattages. Uh, and you know, RunScribe tends to be closer to Garmin. Um, there is no right answer there. And again, anyone that says there's a right answer for running power is full of it because there's no agreement in the scientific community on how to even measure running power. There's a lot of papers out there, but no one agrees. And so I'm not going to say Stride is right and Garmin is wrong, or Polar is right and Garmin is wrong, or RunScribe is right and Garmin is right. No one really. Knows knows. I'm more interested in consistency right now. That's kind of where the technology is. And I think this has potential. I'm just, we got to still see. Like some of the sprints weren't as hard as I thought they would be from a wattage standpoint or size I thought they'd be from a wattage standpoint. And then some of the easier runs were a little bit higher than I thought. So we'll see down the road. Note that it will continue to work with third-party running sensors. So run, scribe, stride, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll all continue to work with both the units, by the way. So you can use stride with the cheaper one if you want to. No problems there at all. Speaking of sensors, it supports a full complement of Bluetooth smart sensors. Both both units do, uh, power, heart rate, cadence, speed, etc., all that kind of stuff. No AMP Plus support still. Uh, that ship has clearly sailed for Polar, and obviously they're losing sales because of it, but it is what it is. And I think at this point, most sensors are dual AMP Plus Bluetooth smart anyways, so it's really only if you had like older AMP Plus sensors, especially older AMP Plus power meters, that it may be more of an issue for you. Next, the two biggest features that Polar is going to talk a lot about are their training load and recovery features, which has kind of been the trend in most watches over the last uh, year and a half, two years, Garmin and Suunto both using first beat for those metrics. Polar kind of rolling their own. Uh, and what it's doing is going ahead and kind of accumulating or tracking all of your training time across different categories. So it's doing it across a cardio category, a muscular category, and a perceived effort category. Uh, and so you're putting a perceived effort as to how hard that workout felt to you. And that takes all these things together. And then from that, it starts to generate recovery times. Uh, now, right now on this watch, the recovery bits are not yet implemented uh, fully anyways. There's like some basic stuff, but not, not totally implemented. So I can't really show that entirely on the training load portion that does seem to be kind of working but it takes a lot of time uh, for that to totally accumulate they're saying about a month and right now I'm just a bit over a week on it so um, you know I'm getting like it's starting to normalize a little bit like two days ago it said I was under training despite having done two to three pro cuts a day on the watch uh, in the last week so I it's getting there but now it's starting to kind of normalize so that as the the watch learns you uh, it just starts to give better data now, before we dive into some of the hands-on interface on the watch, I've got to talk about some things that didn't make the cut. Uh, now, normally when you release a new watch, uh, you add features to it. You take your baseline, you add a bunch of features, and that's your new watch. Not exactly what happened here. There's a bunch of features that aren't actually coming forward uh, from the V800 or other Polar watches onto this. So I've got my list here. I had to pull it out because it's, it's kind of long. Uh, so first is a section of features that will be returned, uh, just not immediately. So the Polar is saying for these features by the end of quarter one, 2019, so the end of basically March uh, 2019. Uh, number one, smartphone notifications is not on this. It does use smartphone sync from like a you know activity standpoint but no smartphone notifications. Number two, fitness test functionality is not here yet, so that'll be coming back. Same with standalone device timers. Uh, also Strava segments, Strava real-time live segments on the watch itself, not there. Uh, number whatever it is, uh, back to start navigation will be coming back, uh, but there's no back to start navigation on this right now. Um, and then also some additional detail in the training summary for workouts itself. Uh, so when you finish a workout to be able to see some of that additional detail there. And then there are a handful of features that are not coming back at all, like that they've, they're dead, they're being killed off, buried, put in a coffin. Uh, number one is GoPro Action Cam Control. That's mostly because GoPro has stopped their own developer program, so Polar really doesn't know what to do with that at this point. Um, number two is following of any sort of downloaded routes. So uh, navigation, there's really no navigation at all in this, which is why the back to start feature isn't coming yet because zero navigation whatsoever in this watch today. And once there is, it's just gonna be back to start. Uh, 
And number three is the reduction or elimination of the additional GPS recording modes like you've had in the past. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is 40 hours by itself in one second recording mode, so that's pretty solid. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and look at the watch interface itself. I'll show you kind of the how it works and stuff like that, and then we'll go ahead and look at some GPS accuracy testing after that. Okay, so looking at the watch faces themselves, on the left-hand side here, we have the Vantage V, and on the right side here, we have the Vantage M. Again, the colors don't matter because you can get either edition and either color. Um, I'm gonna focus mostly on the Vantage V over here because of the fact that I've been using it the most over the last week, uh, and the fact that it has more features to show. In terms of the Vantage M, it's pretty much the same feature from like a UI standpoint. Obviously, it's not gonna have the Recovery Pro bits because they aren't, aren't in there, uh, and it doesn't have a touch screen because it's not a touch screen, right? There's no touch there. So I'm gonna slide this off the side for right now we're going to focus just on this to keep us nice and front and center um, now from a touchscreen standpoint i can go ahead and just swipe left and right there and you can see it goes to the current heart rate i can press this right button there once and it goes into that so the max heart rate today is 88 beats per minute so i spent the whole 15 hours today flying across the ocean uh, the minimum for today is 45 beats per minute and that's pretty much all it shows i use this lower left hand button right there to get back uh, so I go back to this page and I can swipe through some of these menus here. Now this is the one area where you actually have to use the touch screen uh, to get between the different pages. You can't use the other buttons to get there. Once I've got a page, I can click open here, that red button, and now I can open up uh, my past running and trading activities. So I can go ahead and I click this again, the red button, and I can look into this particular activity last night's run that I did, just kind of a short run playing around with some of the heart rate to see how things would work there uh, on some shorter intervals. And I can go down here, I can scroll this way um, using the touch screen right there. Uh, it's not quite perfect as you can see, but it's, it's getting there. Um, but the screen looks really, really nice. Like the clarity of some of these colors is really, really pretty. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and use the buttons just because it works a little better right now. Again, kind of some of the beta aspects there. Uh, calories, you can see pace, speed zones, like this particular screen here, if I go like this and get a little bit uh, off, off angle of the light there, is just really, really sharp. Uh, and go down here, there's my power, so you can see my average power for this run, 366 watts, max power 505 watts. Uh, the muscle load there, that's some of the pieces that contribute to the different uh, training load portions, in particular this one for the uh, muscle portion of it, you got cardio load, muscle load, uh, as well as your perceived load. So going down through this a bit more, power zones coming in this case from running. If I was cycling, I would get cycling power zones. Laps, uh, kind of the same stuff you would normally expect there. Keep, continue going down and that's sort of the end of the road. And this is an area they're adding more detail over the next couple months into. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to the main watch face though again back out here swipe right again uh, and we're back to kind of like the nothing burger page like there's nothing you can really do with this page except the time activity is where i can see my activity for the day uh, so only 434 steps uh, this is probably not handling the time zone change very well at this point um, because I, I walked a whole lot more this morning at the airport again 15 hours ago uh, but that's all right kind of some minor beta bugs there uh, and then going and oops, it's, I keep meaning to click this, but this is like the, the UI is not quite done yet. This is the training load piece there. Uh, so <clears throat> I can go and open this up. And you saw initially in that previous screen, if we go back there, you can start to see the training load on the top right edge there as it goes around. And then when I open this up, I can see more detail around that. So I'm right now uh, in maintaining, which is the upper left-hand side there, uh, detraining down here, productive and overreaching. And now because I've only been using this a little over a week right now, these portions are still kind of learning me. They're saying it takes up to about a month, which is kind of the same as first beat does as well. Uh, and so like, even though I was doing two to three workouts a day for the last week, I was still in detraining, which was kind of funny. Um, then we got maintaining, we have strain and tolerance, and these are basically looking at different parameters of your training load over a given time frame, uh, both a seven day rolling um, time frame as well as a month long rolling time frame. Uh, it's telling me I've been training less than usual, which is again kind of funny because I've been training way more than usual actually on this watch, but this is some of the pieces where it's just got to learn me a bit more. And then this is also areas where Polar really does want to stress this is beta, it's not done yet. Uh, so some of the stuff here isn't finalized. Now, if I go ahead and hold this right button down here, I can get into the sports selection mode. Uh, so very similar to what you've seen in the past on other Polar products, all the sports are downloaded from Polar Flow. You choose what you want and don't want, configure pages and so on. So CrossFit here, I can swipe through these, mobility, uh, see if I can find one that locks on a GPS here. So hiking, uh, that road running, there we go. 
Um, so you can see right there that green means it found GPS. Now I did go ahead and I found GPS here in this park after my flight. Uh, but even then it only took maybe 10, 15 seconds for it to refine GPS after flying, I don't know, 5,000 miles, whatever it was. Uh, and then the heart rate there, it's not gonna lock because on the back here, uh, I'm not, my skin's not on that, it's not touching it. And if I go ahead and I probably trigger these sensors by putting my fingers on it for a split second, uh, you'll see it'll start lighting up. And that is a new optical heart rate sensor on the back there, uh, illuminating. And you know, it only did that once I put my fingers on there because I had electrical contact right there uh, and then once I would hold it long enough it would eventually give me the green light that I'm good to go and start that run um, I can go ahead and then tap this oops there sorry I can tap this and to begin the run and so now you can see some of the run data pages I would have uh, and I can go ahead and use the up and down keys these two keys right there to change data pages in this mode the touch screen is disabled as I mentioned before uh, in a workout mode so I can go through these I can see wattage for example right there obviously I'm, I'm sitting at a table so you're not gonna see that uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop this run by pressing this left hand bottom up there pause and then I just hold down again to go ahead and end that workout just like that and now because it is a short workout it'll ask me if I want to delete it I'll go ahead and say yes because I don't want that hosing up all my metrics um, finally on the settings front I go ahead and just I tap this once down there uh, and you get into start training another way to get into some of the different workout modes notifications isn't yet enabled uh, orthostatic test is where we go ahead and use a heart rate strap to do uh, the recovery portion that is required for recovery pro that you use a Polar H10 heart rate strap in particular uh, to go ahead and get these numbers there. And then I go down into settings here. Uh, and I like the way they've changed the layout slightly here. So you got kind of the settings panel on the left-hand side and the different sections, so general settings. Once I go into that, now it says general settings. This is where I compare heart rate sensors, uh, turn on and off continuous heart rate, tracking, flight mode, units, language. Uh, pretty much the usual settings that you would expect throughout here. You can kind of just scroll through some of these, you know, pretty, pretty common stuff. Um, VO2 max, and then finally watch settings as well, uh, watch time, and, and so on. Okay, now switching over to a very quick look at data. Uh, because this video is already absurdly long, we're just going to blow through this. Uh, I've linked a bunch of sets, though, down in the description there on my post. Uh, so you can look at tons of data from a bunch of different rides and runs. Uh, but for this video, one data set just because, again, it's, it's crazy long. Uh, so heart rate, I can tell you right off the top of the bat, things look really, really nice here. I'm not just running and not just just intervals but also cycling which is something I've seen really optical sensors struggle with um, but it's very very good in this case this run was kind of an interval run of sorts uh, and it looked blocky because I'm zoomed in a bit so that's why you're seeing what you're seeing there um, but you're seeing the, like these intervals here all three of these sensors match really well between the two Vantage sensors on two different wrists the Scos Rhythm 24 and I also had a ticker strap on there as well uh, but I kind of moved that to make it a little more clear uh, even on these shorter intervals right here, uh, they're very, very close together, which is nice. Uh, the Scotia is, is tracking a little bit faster than the, the Vantage, but still really, really clean stuff. If we go down to the GPS side of things, that's where things get a little bit rough. Uh, and this is true no matter kind of where I've run with this, and things just cut a lot of corners. And so you can see right here on some of these tracks, the green track there is a Vantage V. Uh, the red track right here coming through there is a Vantage M. And more or less, anytime there was a corner, the Vantage series would cut through it. You can see it right here through this, what would be some buildings right there if we go ahead and enable this. Uh, so you can see it kind of cut across there, cut across the park. Uh, up here, if we go to this side over there, it cut through these buildings. Um, I was over there and all the other watches tracked really, really nicely through these sections. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't do it right in a nutshell. Um, and if we go up here to this building, there's a little tunnel you go through right there and it just simply like cut across the museum entirely. Um, then they went through the buildings, into the river, and that's kind of the general, like again, the gist of what I see. Even on out in sort of the countryside, it kind of does the same thing. Now, of course, this is beta, and it is something that Polar is aware of. I've seen these sets from me, uh, so hopefully that'll get fixed soon. Um, it is, again, six or so weeks before things hit uh, the final release, so that gives them some time to kind of sort out some of these early bugs. Okay, so there you go, a look at the new Vantage V and Vantage M. One last brief thing I wanna mention here is that the Vantage M does have removable straps. So you can go ahead and pop these straps off right here, put these removable straps on there. Uh, and they're standard issue, standard industry watch straps. Uh, so you can go ahead and use any one you want out that you find on Amazon. The Vantage V unfortunately does not have that though. So its straps are just at straps. You can replace them in the case of breakage, uh, but there's no like custom straps or anything like that. Overall, I think Polar's made some good progress on this watch. It's definitely a really pretty watch. It looks really nice. It feels really nice wearing it. My only concern is they've spent almost five years developing this watch 
and they've really only got three features to show for it. They've got the training load, training recovery, uh, and running power. So we'll see how that shakes out. Again, it is early. It's still in the beta cycle, so I'm not going to count those uh, chickens quite yet. Uh, expect me to do a full in-depth review on the site in late October, which is when they start shipping. Also, don't forget to check out my full preview post in the description there. I've got tons of data sets I put in there if you want to dig into all my data over the last week or so, uh, so you can check all that out. With that, thanks for watching. Don't forget to whack that like button at the bottom there as well as the subscribe button. I really appreciate it. Have a good one.